This is API Case Files. Case Files. Hear this message. Tune this channel. Hello, and welcome to API Case Files. I'm Marcia Barnhart, API Chief of Investigations and your host for this episode. Later on, we'll hear from API Director Paul Carr and one of his Unidentified Science episodes, this one on human memory and witness recall. Also, I'll introduce you to API's newest investigator, Roger Draper. On this podcast, API Case Files, we examine aspects of cases we've just investigated or are in the midst of investigating, and we have some very interesting cases to share with you. Let's start with a case I recently closed as unidentified. Frankly, we don't end up with too many unidentified case findings. More often than not, on a case that we investigate to completion and where the witness stays engaged throughout the investigative process, we typically find a most probable, most plausible, most scientifically inclined explanation. This constitutes approximately one quarter of our cases. Another quarter of our cases are often too old to investigate. These are witness reports that are perhaps decades old and often without clear dates or times. It's hard to conduct a meaningful investigation, for example, on a case 10 years ago where the witness had no clear recollection of the year or the month. So those are just entered into our case files and closed as uninvestigated due to inadequate witness information. What is provided, although too inadequate on which to base an investigation, is nevertheless important data that we feel should be on record. So that info goes into our database. There is another quarter of our caseload that is not fully investigated due to lack of witness engagement. These are cases that look promising to start with, but the witness discontinues contact. At the start of our investigations, we typically like to conduct a telephonic interview to gather more detail and context. Many times, once we conduct the interview, the witness then never replies to necessary follow-up emailed questions. Sometimes the witness won't even engage in a telephonic interview or respond to emailed questions. This hampers the investigative process. It leaves only guesswork, which is not investigation. So. Those case files are closed as uninvestigated due to lack of witness response. But again, we do enter the information into our system as a matter of record. We don't know but what this information might be salient in the future. The final quarter of cases we receive from witness reports are investigated and closed as undetermined or unidentified. In these cases, using the information provided by a reliable, engaged witness, and following evidence uncovered during the investigative process sometimes leaves us without a most probable, most plausible, most scientifically inclined explanation. Such was the case of a sighting just on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky, that took place December 11, 2020, around 6 p.m. This was a very credible two-witness case. A mother and her daughter were driving home on a busy thoroughfare after a shopping spree. The daughter was driving, her mother was the passenger, and she had ample time to observe what looked like a straight-out-of-central-casting, saucer-shaped UFO. We were going down Shelbyville Road, and the traffic was, you know, I mean, not at a standstill or anything, but it was just a little bit slower. And I don't know, but for some reason, my daughter and I were always looking up the sky. We always look at the moon and the stars. And then I was like, 
And we noticed and we thought it was a plane at first because it was at a far distance. But we were like, it's kind of low. But, and it was kind of really far off. But as it kept coming then closer, I was like, well, there's no way that's a plane. And then it started hovering. And then we got even closer to it. And then it was, it was not a helicopter either. I mean, it was like a round disc. And it had little white lights all the way around it, and it had a red light on the top. My daughter was driving, so I got to look at it, you know, a little bit more than she did. But, and then it just, it just stood. It just, like, hovered. It wasn't moving at all. And it wasn't that far up above the tree line. I mean, you could see it plain. And I told my daughter, I said, it was kind of surreal, because it's like, I can't believe what I'm seeing, you know. But after that, it started moving up and going uh, back towards, like, where we came from. And my daughter goes, I want to get a closer look at it. So she drove a little bit, and she turned around in this apartment complex, and we were going then the same way it was going. It was, like, going over the Oxmoor Mall there. It was, like, going over the mall, and it kept going up higher. And by the time we reached the expressway, she wanted to get on the expressway to see, kind of, like, follow it, which way it was going. And then it just shot off really fast. And it was just out of sight. You couldn't even see it. I mean, it went really quick. Did you hear any noises? No, there was no noise at all. That's why I told my daughter at first, before you could get a really good look, before because it kept descending and coming down, like hovering, but coming down. I was like, I don't even hear anything. It can't be a helicopter. And then when it got down to the point where I could see it really well, I mean, there was no sound. And there was no way it was a helicopter or a plane. It was just sitting there. And it was completely just round. I mean, you're like, you know, like a disc. And then it, then it went up, but it wasn't going real fast. And that's when she was turning around the vehicle. And we started going back towards the expressway so we could hop on. Because it was going down the way like the other interstate crosses. So that way we were, she was going to follow it. But it just went straight up and out really fast. So, I mean... There was no following it. Did it leave a trail or anything, or just v- just did a warp drive and was gone kind of no. thing? Right. There was no trail at all. Were there any planes overhead when you saw this? Was, it, was there any plane traffic? Well, I mean, if it was, we would. I was too fixed, fixated on watching that. I was just more focused on that. I wanted to look at it. It was. It was. Uh, it was light, silver like. It was light. I mean, you could see like all the, it's kind of odd. You could see like all the outlining of it all, you know, and you could see, like it was like a silver, you could see it, but it was almost like kind of hard to describe. It's not like you could see through it, but it wasn't like a definite, like if you just looked at your hand and you see something solid, do you know what I mean? It was kind of like a little bit of a transparent, and but it, it just had the little white light that went all the way around it. And on top of it, it had a red light. Like I said, I was just so fixing. I wanted to make sure I could see it because she was trying to look at it and drive. Because I just wanted to make sure I was seeing what I was seeing, you know. Well, it's like we were sitting there, we looked at each other, you know, and we're like, it was just like, did we really just see what we saw? And I was like, well, yeah, because we saw it. We can't deny we saw it. But it's like, I can't believe it, though. It's like, and I said, well, all I know, UFOs are supposed to be an unidentified flying object. I said it. That's definitely what it was, where it was from, or if it was a government thing and they made something. I don't know, but I know what I saw and I know what it looked like. You know, a plane can't just stop and just hover. A helicopter can, yes, but a plane can't. And it wasn't a helicopter because it was, and then there was also no noise. It was completely silent and it was quiet. Plus, I mean, I actually saw it. It was just a disc with lights around it and with red, a red one on the top. It was no helicopter, and it certainly wasn't an airplane either. No way. But all I know is I know what I saw. Just as we were getting on the expressway, it just shot out like a bullet and went straight up, and it was gone. This case, 20-045, that took place December 11, 2020, near Louisville, was closed as unidentified.
This is API Case Files. Case Files. Next up is a case API Director Paul Carr is investigating. This was a two-witness case in Pueblo, Colorado. It took place May 13, 2021, at a campground in Pueblo State Park. Two campers were enjoying time by their cozy campfire. It was dusk, and they had just earlier engaged in a meditation practice that left them relaxed and open. The campers were stargazing and watched a few satellites pass over them in the clear sky above, but starting at around 8 p.m. and continuing into the early morning hours, the campers observed dozens of unidentified lights all over the sky that put on quite a show. Witness 1, the man who filed his report with API, provided this account. This is the second time I've seen something like this, and it just so happens it was with the same friend. So there was, uh, since that was sort of in my in my mind already, that was, I mean, granted it was two years ago, it was pretty quickly that I was catching on to what I was observing. And what it was, was light sources moving suddenly in various directions. Uh, variable brightness uh, at various altitudes and it's difficult for me to de- describe specifically because there were so many at once but it was typically something that looked like two orb like shapes like red and green in color usually with a hue around them of light and the way that they would move it would be like as if you uh, slid a a salt shaker across the table like really quickly from one spot to another and then suddenly stopping. But uh, the the thing that was, well, so we're just seeing this and it's like, do you see this? Yeah, and I'm just taking it in. They weren't producing any sound. Uh, I could see many of them in the same general description of like the two orbs of light the general hue and it, it, it looked as if they were interconnected in a way and that was uh, represented by what looked like a red sort of strands in between them and so it was like interconnected but these were independent and they would move any which way at variable speeds sometimes the paths had curves to them and it was like they would sometimes go to the same spot and almost combine into one or separate. Uh, it looked like lights, in, like if you were to observe the activity in uh, the brain and there's different brain cells lighting up across this network and interacting, except the brain cells, the nodes were not stationary. There was a, another moment in particular, and I included it in my drawing, where uh, my friend was looking one direction. He's like, hey, are you, do you, are you seeing this? Look at this right now. And it was like some sort of motion, like a, like a snake recoiling before it bites kind of thing, or a Venus flytrap uh, about to spring in a fly. Uh, and then uh, like a green light pulse like shoots out of it. It was like a horse. It almost looked like a, a rectangle of light and I, I describe it like a laser light because it's like unidirectional one color of light it's difficult to s- describe in detail all at once in one in a single thought because there is just so much dynamic activity within these lights themselves and between them and uh, the duration of this was all through the night so I didn't see like a metallic craft or anything like that specific but the the nature of these lights was not like anything that i'm familiar with or could attribute to any sort of aircraft and then at one point uh a military jet flew through and it was just uh extremely obvious that it was a military jet just by the 
how loud it was, uh, the way it disturbed the air around it. It was very obtrusive to the whole scene. Uh, when I took the video, at that point, I was seeing so many at once. I uh, I just decided to record. Uh, I'm glad I had the wherewithal to attempt to do that. Uh, I didn't really think I would pick anything up, but I just made sure to hold as still as I could with the hopes of picking something up. And uh, I was surprised to find that I did. An interesting moment I had was... Um, when now it, it's it's tricky to describe because there's there's almost an impression that the the meditation that we did uh and you know this just sits in the back of my mind and when i think about it that the meditation almost tuned us in in a way to be able to observe these it's almost paradoxical in a way in a way of trying to describe it and attribute familiar characteristics to it. But I, I'm, I'm thinking when I'm observing this, it's like there's no, I can't, there's not exactly like a, a, a language for some of these things or how to describe it. That's why I'm like dynamic lights and these motions. Uh, and like I said, I felt very connected, uh, particularly with the earth. And I felt a lot of compassion and and love for the earth and all beings on it, quite frankly. It was sort of like a realization path I was going down. As I'm sort of, as I'm kind of analyzing the, the state of things as I see it in this connected feeling. You may have to humor me here, but as I'm having this thought process, I observe the light um, come down onto the lake in front of me. And this must have been at least about a football field away from me maybe two football fields when I saw it come down it was like it was like it was green the light it was it was lit up like a neon sign though like that the outline of it um it was it looked like school bus size maybe submarine size and it was approximately the shape of a submarine or a cigar type, type shape and uh it was the whole outline of it was this green light and then it just sort of drifted off into v out of view that gave me the impression that it was some sort of interaction and my thinking in that moment was basically like yeah I, I see you I see you there and it's just when I'm then there's just the number of it at a moment I'm like what is this are we are we being invaded right now and you know it's not coming from fear that question and then you know it's like if if that was the case then you know what it doesn't make a difference at this moment because clearly the technology is more sophisticated than anything that we have because I don't I don't know anything that can defy gravity in the way that these lights appeared to be doing This case, 21021, is still under investigation by Paul, and he's conducting video analysis of the footage provided. Interestingly, the witness description of a large neon green cigar or tubed-shaped craft dovetails right into a case I'm currently investigating in central Ohio. There, two witnesses experienced a large, fast-moving, neon green cigar-shaped craft zip overhead their car at treetop level, make a hard left-hand turn in front of them, and then another immediate hard left-hand turn, and shoot away. The speed and movements of this craft so far defy explanation. This case in Ohio occurred May 15, 2021, two days after the Colorado witness saw a neon green cigar-shaped craft. Now, two days after the Ohio sighting, we have a case that took place in Caldwell, Idaho, on May 17, 2021. This was around 10.30 at night. The experience completely unnerved the witness, but he was able to provide compelling video footage of the encounter. He provided this narrative of his experience.
Okay, now this isn't the first time I've seen stuff, but this specific encounter was much different than anything else I've seen. Okay. Now, I've seen little orbs or whatnot, just looking at the sky many times, but within the last few months, it started January 1st, and that's the first time I've seen anything. My wife saw it first, we were in the backyard smoking. The last few weeks, it's been increased quite a bit. So anyway, I've had my eyes to the sky a bit more. Um, I stay up kind of late because my schedule changed a few weeks ago with my job, so I just am working nights now. So when I get home, I have to unwind, and I, I like to sit outside. It's warmer, it's beautiful, the stars are out, and we kind of live out in a dark area where you can see things a lot better. So it's really nice to look up and just see everything. So I'm, I'm familiar with what stars are around me, and I take a great interest in, you know, looking at the sky and... I've got an app on my phone, Google Star Maps, so I know if I see something that looks funny, I just check it. And I've got flight radar as well, and I check that too. So there are some times where I look at something, oh, what's that? And I check it out real quick on my phone, like, oh, okay, now I know, you know? So I see something behind my house quite a way off in the distance that looks different. At first I think, okay, it's just a satellite. I've seen those plenty of times crossing over uh, Caldwell by me and, and heading probably towards the Boise Mountains a bit. Um, but this definitely was not because those are much smaller. And you can really tell because they tra travel in a pretty linear fashion. At any rate, so I stand up and I start backing up a little. So there's a cloud above my house. And as it's coming towards this little cloud, I'm expecting to see it go on the other side, but it does not. And then I'm like, okay. That's odd. So I back up from my house a bit into the the driveway, kind of, and uh, so I can see below the top of the house, below the cloud, and that's when I see it just sitting there below the cloud. I'm like, well, that's very unusual. And as I'm looking at it, it starts to move upwards, back through the cloud and above the cloud, and that's when I started recording because I was like, this is not – I've never seen anything like this. So I'm very excited at first, as you can tell in the video. Um, and it's, it's it's very neat. The second time I've really seen anything, and I uh, got it on camera. And then as I'm watching it, it goes up through the cloud, and then it starts to move back towards the west. Except this time, it's heading more towards my direction than in the direction that it came in. And as it gets closer, I start to feel more like nervous. And I'm sure it's because of the unknown or whatnot, but the fear starts to grow exponentially as it gets closer to me. And I'm recording this because it's real. And I'm like, what in the world? Now, this is like an orangish orb glow, like a light, yes. And as it gets closer, I start feeling more and more fearful. And I have a, on my front patio, a little awning before you get to the door. And as it gets closer, it feels like it's almost purposely making its way above me to make a point almost. But the, it just felt like in that moment, like it was trying to prove I'm bigger than you or I know, you know, it just, it, this feeling, it was really overwhelming. And as it came right directly above me, still the same height in the sky, um, I decided I wanted to move underneath the awning because I didn't feel so safe out in just the open, even if it was in front of my home. Um, it was really terrifying. Um, at any rate, as it got directly above me, the light seemed to dim down just for a minute, but I could still see the object above me. Uh, it was very difficult to keep filming right there because my hands were shaky and I was very scared. Um, and then it just started moving again. It was a brief moment that it stood there before it moved on. And as it moved on, I continued talking about it in the video the light kind of comes back a little bit. And as it continues going away, it heads towards the moon. Uh, again, this is this would be west towards Oregon again. And as it's going away, I can see it much clearer. The video does not do it justice at all. But with my own eyes, I could see two very, very close together orbs that were flying together, it seemed. Where it, at first it was one. This is after it was over me. And then the two colors of it were like a red and blue, but very hazy or cloudy. And it almost seemed like they were switching the colors between each other. 
and I watched it until I couldn't see it anymore. It went all the way towards the moon, probably from my view, it would be to the right of the moon, but not directly at it, but I, until I could not see it anymore. I wanted to mention, um, I was making a point to send out positive thoughts with my mind. Like, I didn't know if, because I've been seeing these things, this is the most intense sighting I've had, but it wasn't something that was just like, oh, I saw this thing. It was a whole experience that really shook me. And I've settled down since, but that first night, of course, I had a very difficult time sleeping up until like maybe 4 a.m. It just, all I could think was lock all the freaking doors, you know, and I was just scared. And it, it took me probably a day, a day and a half to really feel normal again. This case, 21-019, in Caldwell, Idaho, on May 17, 2021, is still under investigation. If you're interested, links to some of the visuals supplied by our witnesses can be found on our show notes page for this episode. Now, in just a few minutes, I'll introduce you to our latest investigator, Roger Draper. But first, here's API Director Paul Carr with another in his series of Unidentified Science. It's good to be back with Unidentified Science. I'd like to do many more of these, but other things have much higher priority. For example, trying to catch up on my backlog of cases going back to 2017. For this unidentified science, I want to once again talk about human memory. In unidentified science number three, we talked about the huge unsolved problem that eyewitness testimony is for understanding UAPs. Not only are there some well-documented problems with eyewitness testimony in criminal cases, but in general, human memory is not only fragile, but malleable. It's not just that we forget things, but that we can remember things we shouldn't. And not just minor details. Researchers have shown that it is possible to plant false memories in people things that never happened. The problem for us is, most of what we call evidence in our field is human memories of events. As much as we'd like it to be far less dependent on that, it's not going to happen soon, and there seems little prospect that witness memory is going to get better. Furthermore, attempts to recover memories are not only unreliable pseudoscience, but fraught with ethical issues. API's Code of Ethics prohibits it, and we strongly recommend against it. If you want to know more about the dangers of memory recovery, look up the Satanic Panic. Families were destroyed and lives ruined because of hypnosis and other memory recovery therapies. That's therapies in scare quotes, by the way. So, what to do? We don't want to throw out all eyewitness evidence, but we need a way to make it as reliable as possible. Independent corroboration is great, but very hard to come by. Failing that, nothing we can come up with will be airtight. Let's accept that as reality and try to figure out what can be done. One thing we think works well, and we make a big emphasis of, is sketches. We want all witnesses of whatever artistic skill level to make annotated sketches of what they saw 
as soon as possible after the event. For example, in case 1810 CE1, the witness went home and made annotated sketches within an hour or so. These weren't artistic at all, but were very helpful in the investigation. In our view, this kind of contemporaneous documentation bolsters the credibility of the case, and there is evidence that these sketches support the witness's memory of what they saw. A study published in 2018 by the University of Waterloo in Canada found that drawing led to superior memory retention over other techniques. So, we encourage UAP witnesses to make as many sketches as possible as soon as possible after the event. Another thing witnesses can do is not be ashamed of not remembering something. Please don't fill in a gap with something you don't directly recall. What can investigators do? Well, the first thing is to stop corrupting witness memory. This starts with a report form. Using menus and other interface elements can suggest possibilities to the witness that shape their memories. For example, if you ask a witness for shape in the form and the first item in the menu is disk, that even though they might remember something more elliptical, they can be unconsciously influenced by that and say disk. This is one reason to keep the form minimal. A report form only takes a few minutes to fill out, and that was on purpose. It should help prevent procrastination. If you know, it will only take you a few minutes. We don't ask for any details, although the witness can volunteer as much information as they wish. When interviewing witnesses, we always let them tell their story first without interruption. We listen respectfully, but suggest nothing. After that, we ask them to clarify or provide further details about what they have already described. It's hard not to ask leading questions, but it's important. Every question you ask should be either be some matter of fact that they would reliably know, or questions that make minimal assumptions about what was observed. If you interview multiple witnesses, it is best whenever possible to talk to them separately. Listening to witness one's account may well alter witnesses to memory in ways that are impossible to predict. Finally, it would be great to have some reliable red flags that can help us know when the witness is struggling with recall is simply confabulating or both. I admit, I have little to offer there and I'm going to have to punt it to the psychologists. They are working on a much more precise understanding of what types of memories are most unreliable. Maybe I need a trained professional in the room to detect these kinds of problems. Oh, to have that kind of funding. We'll keep following the science on this. Dogmatic dismissals of all eyewitness evidence are, in my view, not at all warranted, but neither is taking everything witnesses remember literally. I'll have more to say about that in the next Unidentified Science. API is a very small organization. We conduct a lot of investigations with very few resources and personnel. That's why we always appreciate getting a new investigator on the team. Of course, this work is unpaid and volunteer, so one has to be dedicated to this kind of work to stick with it, and not everyone is. But we have a new investigator now that is based in California, near San Francisco. He has a background in computer science, missile science. He's done a lot of sensitive work for the U.S. government in various disciplines, and he has law enforcement experience. I talked with him at length about his background and experience, so I'd like to introduce you now to our latest investigator, Roger Draper. Um, I was actually born in a little bird called Price, Utah. 
<clears throat> but early on, I believe I was like six years old, we moved to the southeast corner of Utah, which was called Moab, Utah. After I graduated from high school, I went to uh, Snow College. Um, went to Snow College and thought I was going to become a physical educational person um, in the high schooling system. That was going to be my vocation. I changed my vocation after two years there, and then I went to University of Utah um, into computer science. And I graduated in late 69. After the university, um, I came to California. I had a brother that was out here stationed on TI and started working for the government at uh, the Naval Weapon, uh, Oakland Naval Supply Station in Oakland. And I spent uh, two years there. And then from there, I was uh, lotteried up with the draft and was put in the Army. And then to make the Army career short, I actually was discharged from the Army, stayed at, at that time, uh, I was at Fort Sill, stayed at Fort Sill and worked as a civilian training Army personnel in what I was doing, then left there and came back to Oakland Naval Supply and worked there in the computer vendetta and then later on to Naval Weapons Station. So I ended up working for DOD for 28 years. I worked with the missile systems. I worked in uh, quality control. And then I worked in public affairs. I worked in Code 05. I worked in Code 50, Code 3, Code I worked uh, fraud, waste, and abuse. And then I did a lot of investigations and traveled around a lot to, uh, in pursuit of that. When we did... Uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and Desert Sweep, the munitions that I had sent over, that was sent over to Iraq, um, there was malfunctioning or there was cases where things had been damaged. And this was in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. We were doing videoing. In other words, we would have a video transmission running simultaneous while we were looking at it here they were showing us there and we were deciphering what needed to be corrected and how to correct it and correcting it that way instead of all the time flying back and forth trying to see what they were talking about uh -huh. it's kind of a unique a unique system that that we went through big transitions a lot of transitions through um, softwares and, and things of that nature. Um, you have investigative background, which is a good fit for, for the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations team. And you maintained a um, private uh, investigator's license. You, you gained that and maintain that? I'm a licensed private investigator in the state of California. I have been for almost 30 years at this point, when I left the government and had not much to do, one of my friends, who was one of the commanders at the sheriff's department, asked me to go to work for them. So I was actually picked up as a paid per diem deputy. Um, I did a lot of deputy duties, but um, I was in an, a detective in Danville, and then I ended my last seven years with them as a detective in the uh, main office in Martinez. Did you have an interest in the UFO phenomenon or, or anything of that since a child? When I was growing up in Moab, I had an incident, incident with another friend of mine. We were down in LaSalle, uh, south of Moab, down in the Red Rocks, and we witnessed a UFO land. We watched it we watched two beings get out of it, walk across the sandstone. I mean, if you visualize this is red sandstone, this hard, not sand desert, it's hard rock desert. 
and kind of in amazement watched this, uh, which at the time seemed like forever in amazement and until it finally flew away. We only talked to, I think we talked to his uncle about it, never said anything to my parents about it, never said anything to my one brother about it. And then two years later, we had played football in, I'm trying to think, I think it was Grand Junction at the time. So we were coming back from Grand Junction. And the bus, we saw a UFO, something we couldn't identify, didn't look like an airplane, stayed close in proximity, didn't go fast, didn't go slow. The bus, you know how fast a school bus goes. And my brother and I, my brother was there at that, that, that time. So we thought there was probably five, six others. The rest of the people, we were trying to get them to look. Nobody would look. It's like you're full of you know what. So in my high school, I'd already encountered these. I also had another friend, older, who worked for White Sands. And he was working, he was living in Moab, but working out of Green, Green River, Utah. And they were firing the Honest John, they were firing the missiles from Green River to White Sands at the time. This was all testing. So he'd let us know when tests happen. So we had opportunities to watch missiles, you know, and knowing what they were, knowing what we were watching. So very well identified as to, okay, this is a missile, this is a plane, and this is a, what is this? At one time we had... Uh, and I couldn't remember how the incident transpired, but we were invited to someone's house. The presentation was on unidentified flying objects. And I kind of sat there, you know, quietly, never said anything, never told anybody what that I had ever seen one. And I probably never had planned to. I talked to my brother about it later. You we agreed we're just not going to say anything to anybody. This wasn't something we ever were going to follow up on. But it was a real unique experience because I remember we sat in a circle and they did this presentation in the middle, a lot of it then about George Adamski. Well, uh, so you know how my mind started wandering from here to there and then – Transpiring after that, I'd graduated from high school, went to college, and gone on with my life. That was how I became interested in UFOs. It never leaves you, <clears throat> and I can, uh, if you remember when uh, Travis uh, Walton um, was abducted and returned, when he came back, do you remember the, back in those days? I'm one of the people that got to talk to him uh, shortly after he after he returned. It was it was really, really interesting. You could tell the gentleman was really sincere. You could tell he was still scared. It it was easy and hard to believe at the same time, but it was so believable in the way he presented it, the way he answered the questions to it. So it was extremely, extremely interesting. So I, I've, I've had the opportunities to talk to him. I don't know if you know who uh, Whitney Schreiber is. Streber? Whitley Streber. Streber. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, I've talked to him three or four times. I had uh, back in the 80s. I had talked to him. And then um, when I was actually, I tell you this much, I, when I actually worked with the government, I uh, did a lot of communicating with uh, Leonard Springfield. And I don't know if you know about Leonard or not. Yes, I do. So you, at some point in your career, were directed to have a working relationship with Leonard Stringfield, who did abductee regressions and looked into the UFO phenomenon? Yes, but he not only did that, he had a lot of other attributes that he did. You know, he was, uh, he actually was an, an an assigned person by the government in different countries to do research. 
You, I don't know if you knew that. Research on the UFO phenomenon? Mm-hmm. So he worked with, he kind of contracted out to governmental agencies to go abroad and, and ask others, um, what, in, in governmental positions about UFOs and the assorted phenomenon? Uh, kind of, but he wasn't contracted. He actually worked for the government. Uh-huh, okay. What, what did he, what was he supposed to be doing for the government when he worked for the government? He literally was trying to gain information on the, the UFO phenomenon. That was his task. Um, not in the way you're saying it, but it, to make it real short and sweet, yes. And through doing this, he acquired an, just an army, an array of people who would confidentially give him information. And one thing about Leonard is he would never divulge, really, really staunch on, never, ever divulge on who informed him of what. Uh huh. But now let me get this straight, Roger. This this guy, uh, Leonard Stringfield, would go out on behalf of the government, paid by the government, working for the government, to ask people about UFO experiences and the assorted phenomenon, all at the time that the government said they were expressly not interested in such a thing? Well, it, yes. In what you're saying, the answer is kind of yes, but uh, he was in Bolivia. He was in many countries uh, acquiring... It was, it was it was known information. It was not necessarily known by the general public, but it was government known, and he would do he would do the investigations on those. Yes. What would they do with the information he provided? Do you know? We don't know what happened to information that was acquired. This is what, like I said, this is what became unique about Leonard later, later on. You know, it was unfortunate that he passed away in the 90s, I think uh, mid-90s when he passed, is he had such an abundance of knowledge, and he was trying to figure out how to put it out to where he could get more information as well as release information that he had and do it rightfully, legally so. He was under the same problems that most of us have. Non-disclosure agreements? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Then knowing all that, um, then you, even though you are a, to a degree, in, in the science technology field, you always had one side of you that knew that that strange woo-woo things actually do occur that are not supposed to be able to occur. So that must have been uh, kind of a schizoid environment. The biggest reason, let me tell you, the reason that I am interested in API is I'm more interested in finding out how to help people identify what it is they're seeing so that they don't run off the handle, get their mind wrapped up in something that isn't, and then it make a joke out of what is really real when it's real. Right. Yeah, you you want to bring the seriousness that the subject of the investigations into this phenomenon requires, because there are some actual, factual, real, strange occurrences that people experience, um, and they they can't be laughed off. Even if they have watched some show on TV and that has flashed across their minds when they've seen something, so they transfer that information into what they saw, that's one thing. But it's nice if they realize that at some point and you can help them in an easy manner or general public to understand that yeah there's there are people who claim things but there are actually people out there that absolutely definitely experience strange things yeah yeah i have found in doing this work and and through some of my own experiences that people who have genuinely experienced something that physics tells them is patently impossible, then that 
unmoors your life and you are kind of um, wobbly and your, um, your BS meter gets off. You have to recalibrate your BS meter because you have to learn to discern what is BS and what is factual once you've seen something that people tell you is impossible. There's an awful lot of um, lying and fake news and people who hoax. And, you know, in my opinion, people who hoax a UFO story or something associated like that, I find them as, as sociopathic. A sociopath is somebody who gets a lot of, you know, to one degree, gets a lot of pleasure out of lying so well. They get people to believe some outlandish story. Well, that's a sociopath de facto, in my opinion. And there's a, there's a lot of that out there. They don't, you know, they just think it's for a lark. They're putting out videos that look so good that some people are believing that they're factual. That is really causing so much problem in this um, field. It just aggravates me so much. But you can't, it's like a whack-a-mole. You cannot stop it. It, it's it's hard for that's one of the things it's, it's that I want, was interested in is you know well one why would somebody well obviously like you said sociopath but why would somebody want to do that to show maybe they can yeah I mean, to me this is a serious topic it really is it's not anything to make light of yeah I have friends that try to joke about it and I just I'm well. I've always just turned and walked away because I know different. Right, right. But well, I've I've found um, in this day and age, with all the information that is available and and real factual information, if you are the least bit interested, you can parse out the crapola from the real truthful gems. And there's multiple books out um, that that are very very factual and give you an awful lot of information. One of them is Leslie Kane's um, UFOs, uh, generals and pilots and government officials go on the record. I mean, that is just an excellently written, factual book that is chock full of genuine information on the phenomenon. And um, David Marler wrote a book, uh, Triangular UFOs, an assessment of the situation. Those are factual books. They tell you an awful lot. And, and it doesn't take much to read them if you're at all interested. But there's an awful lot of what is termed the willfully ignorant. They are going to make a joke and say there's absolutely nothing to the UFO phenomenon. And they have read nothing. They have done no study. They've not looked into one real case. So there's an awful lot of willful ignorant out there. And they don't want to be educated uh, for whatever reason. And they don't have to be. It doesn't matter. But, you know, there's there's just no effort put in to find out about the, the subject. But they'll just joke and carry on about it. I, I set those people straight as best I can, you know. Um, you can be willfully ignorant, but don't be willfully ignorant to me because I have facts and information. Right. right. And I actually come up with them and, and I might my, my thoughts instantly are as they're afraid to know what the truth is. Yeah, there's a real there's a a real truth to that. There's um an article written recently. God the man eludes me now. Did an interview with him. Oh my god, this is awful. But he was writing he wrote a very good psychology article about the fact that that the subject is taboo and that people it's one of those things people just do not talk about and they will steer the conversation away from it. It is such a taboo subject. I think that's kind of falling away a little bit. Uh, but but it still exists somewhat. But yeah, it, the neat thing is at API, we're a small organization, but but our interest is in trying to determine what a witness saw or experienced and find the most plausible, most probable, most scientifically inclined explanation if we can. And, you know, and I was telling you that we typically can. Every once in a while, we can't. If we don't have all the data, we can't. But lots of times, if we have a good amount of data, um, then we can unequivocally say that, yeah, this is this is the International Space Station or that was the Starlink satellites or whatever. It's a neat organization in that you can really drill down and find answers for people. And an off a lot of times, people are grateful to know 
really what they saw. One, to know they weren't crazy. Other people saw this phenomenon. Or two, you know, uh, oh, I thought that was that was such and such, but now I find out it's it's just a natural phenomenon that occurs, you know, when, when crystals hit uh, the sunlight or whatever. It's an educational kind of outreach thing to a large degree, and it's very rewarding work, and I think you're going to like it a lot. And I'm glad you're on the team. This brings us to the end of this episode of API Case Files. I've been your host, Marsha Barnhart, and I was joined by my colleagues, API Director Paul Carr and our newest investigator, Roger Draper. Visit our website at aerialphenomenon.org. Here you can find out more about our organization. You can make a UFO report at this site. Just fill out the form provided as completely as you can, and that will generate a report. You can also make a UFO report to us at www.reportauFO.org. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. Links in the show notes for this episode can be found at apicasefiles.com. The spoken content of API Case Files is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 4.0 license. All music heard on this podcast is licensed under Creative Commons. This free use with attribution music is deeply appreciated, and we thank the musicians and songwriters for sharing their creative spirit. Featured during this episode was music by Alien Chronicler, Renacy, and Rain Sleep. Our intro theme music is a mashup of Alien Chronicler and Boxcat Games, and DJ Spooky provides our outro theme music. Meanwhile, thanks for joining us, and we hope you recommend API Case Files and API Conversations to your friends and acquaintances. This is API Case Files. Case Files. Case Files.